Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening for tonight's Inspiration webinar. Inspiration Software is the embroidery software line of G7 Solutions in Designs and Machine Embroidery. Our Inspiration Software line includes My Block Pacer, My Quilt Embellisher, Perfect Embroidery Pro, Perfect Stitch Viewer, and the New Word Art in Stitches. Tonight's webinar features our PEP, Perfect Embroidery Pro, Artwork Appreciation 201. We have a wonderful team assisting us tonight. Dory, Manager of Tech Support, Nancy R., Chris L., and I would like to present you to our Monet of Pep, <laughs> Catherine Artinas, who has embroidery as her palette. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Dory. Uh, the Monet of artwork, huh? Okay. Yes. Something big to live up to. Thank yeah. you. Tonight, we are ready to take the next step with our artwork. Last month, we learned how to use the artwork tools that are built into the software. And this month, we'll play with some of the tools that make creating artwork a bit more automatic. For these shortcuts to happen, we need to make sure the artwork we are using is of good quality for editing and that we have permission to use the artwork. By permission, I mean you should make sure that the artwork you search for online is in the public domain and is copyright free. We all know that we can Google clip art birthday cake and we get a myriad of choices, the majority of which are copyrighted. Maybe you do your search on free clip art birthday cake. The misconception is that any of those images would be free for you to use. That's generally not the case. Here are very basic explanations of some terms you should be familiar with as you search for artwork. There are other things to know when using images that you didn't create from scratch, whether you are wearing them or selling them. So do educate yourself in that area. What I would encourage you to do is to search for sites that offer clip art that are in the public domain and here are two that I tend to use and seem to be reputable. You do want to make sure that your artwork is available to you. We don't want to take something that doesn't belong to us. Once you know you have permission to use artwork, you need to understand what kind of artwork to use. There are two main types of artwork, raster and vector. And here we have an easy way to remember the differences between the two. This analogy is thanks to our good friend Dory. Raster starts with an R. Let's remember ragged edges. As we see here in the S, and we also see these ragged edges here in the image. Vector, starting with a V, should stand for very smooth edges. You see the difference here in our letter S, very smooth, and if we look at this image, all of the edges of that eye are smooth. When we talk about raster images, they are made up of a grid of dots called pixels, and the word pixel is really just a combination of the term picture element. With um, pixels, we have a PPI, which is a pixels per inch. We might be familiar with the DPI, dots per inch, but that generally is when we're talking about printing. It literally is the dots of ink per inch that the printer puts down for each pixel. With pixels per inch, the number of pixels in that inch is determined by the device that you use to create that digital image, whether it's a camera, a scanner, or some graphic software. We also want to be comfortable with the term resolution, which means the number of pixels in an inch. The more pixels there are, the smoother the curve. If we take a look and combine these two, we see we have 10 pixels per inch versus 20 pixels per inch in the same area, and you can see the more dots that you have, the smaller the dots are, the more curve you're going to get on that edge. However, regardless of how many pixels you have in that inch, you are never going to get a smooth curve. If you think about it, these are made up of squares and there's no way that we can 
a color in squares that will give us a smooth curve. If you take a look at this photograph, and we have um, zoomed in on the eye, you can again see all of those pixels and the differences in colors and so forth that give a photograph its detail. Here's another example, a comparison between a raster, which is a uh, pixelated image, versus a vector image. You can see all of the little squares, the pixels. You also notice how detailed the color can be, because with these individual pixels, they can change the color of them, so you get a, quite a bit of detail in your photograph. When you talk about color in a vector object, it really is defined by an area not dots. If we compare both of them, we have a raster and a vector. Remember, raster has the ragged edges. What is important for us this evening with our artwork in Perfect Embroidery Pro are the formats that we use. How do you know, if you look at an image, how do you know if it's a raster or a vector? And what's going to help you determine that is the extension on the um, file name. If it's a JPEG, a PNG or a bitmap, it's going to be a raster. There are other extensions that indicate rasters, but these are the three that you'll um, follow or fall into most often. When we talk about a raster image, they are made of a, dots on a grid called pixels. It's what's called resolution dependent, meaning when a design is created as a raster design, it's created under a certain number of pixels. If you increase or decrease the size, you run the risk of distorting the image because pixels cannot be added in sizing. They are simply stretched or um, shrunk. So we run the risk of that distortion. However, one of the great advantages of raster is their color detail. We saw that in the previous picture. When you talk about vector images, again, having a very smooth edge, the extensions that you will be comfortable with are your WMF, which is your Windows Metafile, your SVG, which is a scalable vector graphic. Those of you that might have a digital cutter, such as a Silhouette Cameo or a Brother Scan and Cut, you will be very interested in this particular format because um, those are used with digital cutters. If you have created a design or a design was created in Adobe Illustrator, it will have an AI extension, and the DXF is going to indicate to you that it was created in an AutoCAD file. Vector images are made up of shapes, points, lines, and curves. Do you remember last month when we played with all of those with our artwork tools? This second one should have a great big star by it because it's the best advantage of a vector. You can size without distortion. Increasing or decreasing this size will not alter the smooth edges on that vector image. The one disadvantage, it, it does have limited color detail. Let's go now into our Perfect Embroidery Pro. And we are going to take a look at these tools that we have this evening that help us with the artwork. We'll start with our backdrop tool. You'll find it over here on the left toolbar. Click on it. And when we click on it, we are brought into the folder that I was last in. Let me show you the path that we follow to get here. We start with the hard drive, your C colon. You'll find your dime folder. Double-clicking on your Dime folder, you'll see your Images folder, and double-clicking on Images will bring you uh, your bitmaps, which you will click, and that's where I'm resting right now. The Backdrop tool only works with raster artwork, in this case, your JPEG files, which is all that you see right here. We can also use our View button and change to large icons so that we can see those images as they are. To start with, we're going to choose the teapot. It's relatively easy, um, not a lot of color involved or shading such as the one you see above it. We are going to start small this evening, so I'll go ahead and double click the teapot. The teapot is brought on screen. We do see some properties over here um, where we normally see our properties for our design. Currently, they are the backdrop properties. And I want you to think of this in a certain way. We see the design here, 
but the design is not really on our design page. I want you to think of it as under or behind glass, such as in a tracing box. I brought this image for you to sort of help you with what's going on with this backdrop tool. If you've used a tracing box or a light box, you know that normally the light source appears down here in the box. You would close the lid and on the glass you would place your original artwork and then on top of that artwork you would lay your tracing paper or your fusible web, whatever it is that you're going to trace onto. For this evening, I want you to think of our putting the artwork, in this case the teapot, under the glass and then with the lid down, we're actually going to do our tracing and so forth, our creating on top of the glass. I thought this would help you to sort of understand what's going on here on the screen. That design is, for our purposes, behind the glass. A couple things here um, in our properties. You see that we could change the height of the teapot. Remember, this is a raster image, and we already know rasters made out of pixels do not size well uh, up high or up low. Um, if you bumped it up a little bit, you probably won't notice too much of a difference. We also want to take a look here at the adjust lightness. This slider comes in quite handy, and we're going to play with it a lot this evening as we work in the backdrop. As I move that slider to the middle and apply it, you can see that what's actually happening is it's fading out the backdrop image. It's still behind our glass and we can see it. You can also drag that all the way to the right side and apply and we no longer see the teapot at all. You'll see in just a moment why those things come in handy. I'm going to drag it back. I like to work with the image being somewhat faded so that I can see what it is that I'm drawing. We have options when we go to create this artwork or turn this artwork into stitches. We could use our artwork tools. These are the ones we played with last month. <coughs> we can also use our magic wand. You see at the moment it is not available for me to use. And we also can use any of our stitch tools as well. We can do a combination, which is what we're going to start with. Let's click on the drop down arrow and choose the pin. Once I've made a decision on the artwork tool I'm using, then you see the magic wand become available to me. I'm going to click it to turn it on. And you can tell that it's on because there's a square around it. But also when I bring my mouse down to the screen, you see I have a blue magic wand. I'm going to come down here on my thread chart and right click on the red so that when I uh, work with this, you'll be able to see it a little bit better. Once you have your magic wand, all you need to do is to come and click anywhere on that thick black line, which represents the teapot. And you may be able to see it now, but I have some double red going around my teapot. While I'm here, I'm also going to click on the circle, and then I'll come up here and click on the circle of the lid. The reason it's beeping at me is because I'm not clicking on the line, so I might need to zoom in a little bit so that I can click right on my black line, and there, it likes what I've done at that point. Let's take a look at what we have. You notice that the properties are now for the artwork. If I want to bring back the properties for the backdrop tool, all I need to do is click on that tool once again, and here are my properties. I'm going to take that slider, take it all the way over to the right, and I have totally faded it out so I don't see it at all, so that you can see what has happened now with our backdrop tool. Remember we started with our pen and the magic wand. Clicking in the black area, it gave us a double around the object. Now. Let me show you why we get this double line. If I bring you back into another slide, this is the teapot zoomed in quite a bit, and you can see that we have the double line going down our thick line of that teapot. Whenever you have a very thick line like this, the software reads both the right-hand side and the left-hand side of that thick line, so this gives us a double. 
you'll see later on this evening where sometimes if there's deviation in the width of that line, we get a different situation. Notice too, this is a raster image. Remember it's made of pixels and you can see those ragged edges right here. When the software goes to um, bring us in that pin line, we also have a little bump, a couple bumps in the road because of that raster ragged edge. We'll come back in and at this point we have artwork. If I bring you over to sequence view and I expand that color red, you see that we have three parts of artwork. I'm going to select all of them at the moment. If we want to continue this artwork and turn it into stitch, we can right click, convert to, and I'm going to choose the satin. Now, with the satin, the reason I chose that is to show you that this double line can be a fun thing. Let me come over here and turn on our 3D. When we had that double line, the software reads that as a column. So it very nicely fills in the satin stitch all around those double areas. The only area that's giving us a little bit of um, fit, I guess, right here is this center because logically we don't want that whole area to be satin. So all I need to do is click it, right click, convert to complex fill, and I have a very nice looking teapot. Let me select that and I'm going to drag that over to the side, come back to my backdrop tool, come over to my slider and bring it back on my screen and we'll now take a look what we need to do if you didn't want this full line, that double and turn it into a satin, what if you really just wanted a single run stitch? The way we would do that instead of choosing our pen artwork, we would come over here and choose our run stitch. The magic wand is still selected as I bring my mouse down onto the screen, I see it turn blue. One other thing we need to do whenever we choose the run stitch to get that single line, I'm going to hold down my shift key on the keyboard. And when I do that, do you notice that my wand has turned red? If I let go of the shift, it's blue. I use the shift, it's red. I'll come back over to that. Um, before I do that, let me change my color here. I'll do an orange and hold my shift key down again, come up and click in that same spot that I did earlier with my black line. I get a single run stitch around there. I do not have the shift key down, just my normal run key. And I'm going to click in that circle to bring it in the, in the middle there. And then if I can do a better job of getting this little tiny circle up there, choose my backdrop tool to bring up backdrop properties and then do my slider all the way over to the right and you can see our second version of our teapot. Again, we got this look by using our run stitch with the magic wand and we held down our shift key. I'll select that, drag that over to the side and we will do one more here with our teapot, bringing our shading back into the middle. What if we wanted to have a filled image? We simply would choose our complex fill button up here at the top. My wand is still activated. I'll come down here and choose a different color, the third color. And this one's very easy. All I need to do is click within those areas. I'm clicking within and right clicking to see the thread. One click will set it, the right click shows the thread. So a click and a right click and here we have our item filled in. You saw how very easy that was. Once again we'll do backdrop tool, slide my light all the way to the edge and you see our other option here with the teal. This is a complex filled teapot. I'm sure you're noticing that the white area in here where all the pieces and parts are actually apart from each other <clears throat> and that's because the thickness of that black line. If you need this teapot to be all one unit, let me bring up a file that I've already started for us. Turn on our 3D so that you can see it. 
This is the teapot we just created with our white areas within. If you need the teapot to look like this, let me show you how you would go about doing it. Here is our teapot that we started with. This time I'm going to uh, get my pin, but I will not use the magic wand. We are simply drawing, or in this case tracing, around our teapot, just as we did last month when we played with all of that artwork. I'm going to click, move my mouse and click, following that image. If you would need to, you certainly could zoom in. You can see that I'm just going to do this relatively quickly so you can see how we're doing it. But if I were going to do this for real, I would probably spend just a little bit more time on my placement. I would probably zoom in and so forth. But I want to give you the idea of this design. I need to go around the outside of my handle. finish the outside of the teapot. If I put three points there, I'll get a relatively smooth curve. A right click will end that part of the shape. I'm now going to trace the inside of the handle. I need to do that if I want that white space to be part of the design. Right click there. And instead of tracing around the circle, I'm going to go back to my artwork tool choose my ellipse, hold down my control key, you might remember that from last week, and draw my circle as I'd like. I'll get my select tool, and in this case I'm going to select these three because I want to change the color so you can see the difference. I'll turn that to purple. Um, the other thing that I might do before I turn it into stitch I know that these are not as nice as they should be, so I'll do a right click and choose smooth. That will change it just a little bit and maybe bring that point in. You could do as much or as little of the editing as you needed to do that. I'm going to do a smooth there. Perhaps I'll pick that circle up. Oop, let me not do that. And straighten that line just a little bit. And again, we could go around our entire teapot in choose to fix anything that we don't care for. I'll make all of those smooth. And then let me choose all of the purple, right click, convert to complex fill. <laughs> yes, and I will undo that because we forgot, we forgot to do something very important. Because I added this inside handle and that circle, the first thing I need to do with all of those pieces is to come up here and do a combine. That way this inner circle and the inner handle will be treated as I need it to be. Now if I do a right click convert to complex fill, you can see that I have exactly what I need for the teapot to be a full unit. Um, again, a little cleanup maybe on some of those points. It's a little bit wonky. Um, but that is how you would go about getting a full complex on this particular teapot instead of these white areas here. All right, let's review just a moment. We'll go back to the first one and we'll see, refresh ourselves what we did here. In this first unit, we did the pen with the magic wand and we simply clicked and got those double runs. Here, to get the single run, we used our run stitch, our magic wand, held down our shift key, and clicked on the line. To get the fill, we first started with our complex fill with the magic wand, and we simply clicked within each of the areas. If we needed the teapot to be solid with none of the white showing, then we got our pen with no magic wand, and simply did the tracing all around our image. All right, we'll stop right there. Are there any questions, Dory, at this point? Yes, we have two of them. Okay. One, one is from Miss Cindy, and she wants to know, is there a way to get curved, um, curved areas if you're in the drawing mode? Absolutely. If I had... Um, 
we can even bring this, I'll just move him back out and I'll grab him and move him out of our way and bring back our backdrop tool. Do my slider so I can see it. Okay, I've lost my backdrop. Let me go back and <clears throat> we'll bring that one up back up again. We went under backdrop and very quickly we will scroll down to our teapot and bring him back up. If I am tracing and I use my artwork tool, the pen, let's say I am going around, I start here in this case and I click my straight lines, but now I'm starting on the curve of this lid. I can click the first one, hold down my control key and continue to click and those points will be curved. I could do the same for this little knob up here on the lid. I'm holding down my control key, letting go and then holding down control and clicking and you'll notice how those dots or points are smooth. If we turn that on and turn off our teapot, you can see that that's a much better job on that curved edge. So the trick to that is to hold down your control key while you're setting your points. Ah, very good. I do have another question. Um, uh, my friend Vicki said she noticed Catherine did not bother to close the line to make a shape. Are there times it is necessary to do this? I did not do a closed shape, but what I made sure that I did, because I had played with this a bit, is when I came back around to that teapot, um, I started down here, and when I came back around, you if you click your um, ending dot or your ending point on top of your starting point, then you should be okay. Um, there are sometimes, some of them are, are odd situations, you can do some things with a open shape by, um, in doing so, I'm trying to think of an example at this point and nothing is coming to mind, but if I were actually going to create that, quite honestly, let's see, uh, let's just pretend that we're doing this bottom plate here on the teapot. If I started here and I came around and was really setting my points, trying to do a good job, not being quick about it, I probably would zoom in on my area here and then get my pen making sure that I click back on that starting dot. If I need to, I could zoom in even more to make sure that I, my two dots were resting on each other so that that is treated as one unit. You always can go back in and say close line and that will do it for sure. Um, sometimes when I'm just doing maybe a run or a bean stitch, I might not close that. I'm not saying that's uh, a good thing to do all the time, but in if I'm thinking of one thing and going on to the next, I might not close there would be a situation where if you were going to fill this area with complex fill, you absolutely need to make sure that that's a closed shape. So you would right click and ask it to close your line. Since I've already done that, it's now grayed out. Ah, very um, good. So, so probably the answer to that is absolutely do it if you know you're going to fill your shape with a um, some kind of stitch. All right, thank you. Okay, doke. All right, we'll start with a clean screen. <laughs> clean screen. Um, we were just playing with raster or bitmap uh, images. Actually, they were JPEG, JPEG images. And the backdrop works with only raster. So the question is, what do we do for vector images? We're going to come up here under File, Import Artwork. Please notice that it has brought us right back into the exact same folder where we took the teapot, but in this case, um, once again, we're going under the hard drive, the dime folder, the images folder, the bitmaps folder, but in this case, we do not see the JPEG files. We see the WMFs, which you may remember are vector. 
there are many, many of those. So instead of looking at large icons, I'm going to ask it to do a list for me. And at any point, I could click on one and see the uh, view over here at the side. We're going to start to play with the bulb, and it's bulb number three. You see it over here in the view. I open it. It comes on the screen. Unlike the backdrop, this image is actually on the design page. I can pick it up and move it around. Um, and all I need to do to turn that into Stitch is to right-click, convert to, and I'm going to go with satin again. Turn on my 3D. You see your thread work. You saw how fast and easy that was. Let's do it again. File, import artwork. This time we're going to go after a butterfly. And those of you who like butterflies are in luck because there's 22 different butterflies that you can choose from. I'm going to start with butterfly 01. You can see it up here in view. We'll do an open. And as we're brought into the screen, I'm going to come over here and change the size of this artwork to four inches. Remember, a vector artwork, we can size up or down without any loss of quality. So there was not, uh, that was an okay thing for me to do. I could have even gone up, say, to 14 inches and put it in my largest hoop. We're going to play with the black area. If I use the plus sign, you see that all of the black is considered one piece of artwork. We'll do a right click, let's come down to convert, and we're just going to play here and see what we get. We'll do a run to start with, and if we turn on our 3D, we see that that's kind of interesting. We just have an outline of the butterfly. We'll go ahead and undo that. The black is still selected. This time a right click, convert to satin. And as it converts, it does a nice job on almost everything. We have one little wing over here that's wonky, and one of the feelers is not quite the way we'd like it. I'm going to ask you to bear with me, please. I'm going to come back and show you how to fix that. We'll do an undo, right-click, convert to, complex fill, and the filling is all relatively nice, but way too many jump stitches. And the reason for that is it started off as one piece of artwork. So we're going to undo, have it back to be that one piece of artwork, select it, and the first thing we want to do is to right click and choose break apart. In doing so, notice that all of the individual pieces of black now are separate artwork. We're going to select all of the black, right click, convert to complex fill, and you see we've taken care of the problem of all of those jump stitches. What I'm trying to show you here with this design is we don't want to get all nervous if something doesn't work the first way. You really want to get comfortable with all of the tools that you have, and if you don't like one particular look, don't be afraid to convert it to a different look. Let's turn this back into satin, and we see this little wonky wing. Again, we don't want to be nervous about that. We're going to zoom in and take a look and see what's actually happening to make this particular piece look different. As I select that part of the design, you can see that the shape of the design is the way we want it. But we need to take a look at these angle lines. To make it easier for us to work with, we're going to right click on one of the points choose to edit just the angle lines. All of the other points go away for the moment. And as we look at these angle lines, please notice that each of these have a left and right counterpart. They go across from each other, and that's as we want the angle to work until we get to these right here. All we need to do to fix this design is take that point and drag it up so that it gives us a left and right counterpoint come over here and apply, and that is the look that we are after. If we scroll up, we can also fix 
this feeler. So we'll go ahead and select it, right click. We want to edit just the angle lines. And if you can see, these have the counterparts to them. This one is a little long, so I probably would drag that more in that range. We have one, I'll drag that one down a little bit, but you see right here we have a situation where there is no left right to this one. Click on that, drag it over, click on that, drag it over, use your apply button, and our feeler looks just as it should. Okay, we'll take our select key. We can finish off this design by selecting the, pur the uh, purple area and the green area. Let me hold on my control key and pick both of them up. Right click, convert to complex fill, and the design is taken care of. I want to spend just a moment here to do something with you that I've done with you before. You know that I strongly encourage you to take a design and again, this one is free. It came with your software. And take it apart. Don't be afraid to play with the individual pieces and parts. If we come over to Sequence View and I use the eyeball on the purple and the green, if I were to save this, it's going to save the black butterfly that I can then use in some other project all by itself. Or if I bring back the green and the purple, and I hide the butterfly, I now can save this as two artwork pieces, some abstract triangles, if you will. But you can move those around and have a very fun time with them, even rotate them. And wouldn't this be pretty, putting a monogram, uh, having this area behind your monogram. So do think of the designs that you have. Rarely are you just given one design. Very often there's multiples in that area. We're going to do one other vector, which is a file, import artwork. This time, we're going to use the ant. You can see him up here in our preview. We'll open it. He's very cute. He's already selected. Right click, convert to complex fill. And in just a moment, he is finished. This is, um, this is a, a um, nod to the quality of the vector artwork that this image comes in so nicely. There is a couple there are a couple things I'd like to point out to you though. If you take a look over at the sequence view, we have black pink, black pink, black pink, and my goodness, I'm not going to want to change my threads that often. So with all of the designs selected, come on over here to edit and choose to do a resequence by color. If you look back in sequence view, we have the majority of black first, all of the pink is together, a little bit more black, white, and a little bit of black. If you're wondering why the software did not put all three black areas together, this software, Perfect Embroidery Pro, is what we call an intuitive software. It knows that it cannot put all of this black together and still have a properly layered design. If it put all of the black together, those black dots would stitch out way before the white does on the eyes, and so too uh, the mouth and the dots that are on the body. So it knows the proper sequence for the layering of all of those colors. There is one other thing to be aware of. When we drag our pink down a little bit, you'll see that that black is solid black under there. I'll do an undo and put that pink back where it was. The pink is still selected, so what we now need to do is right click and remove those overlaps. Once it does, we won't have all that thickness of our stitch behind each other, and you can see that it indeed took out all of that extra black stitching behind the pink. All right. <clears throat> Let's take a look at what happens when the tool we've chosen might not be appropriate for the artwork that we have chosen. We're going to come back to a clean screen and go back into our backdrop tool. Once again, automatically brought back into the folder that we were last in. Again, we are using the backdrop tool, so it's only showing us our raster images, the JPEGs, and we're going to play with our cow. Well, open that cow, he comes on the screen. 
we're not going to play with the size um, very much. I am going to change just a little bit up to a three here, I think, and enlarge him just a bit. I will also fade him out again just a bit so you can see what we're doing. And what I want to show you in this particular um, screen is don't be afraid of trying different things with the same design. We brought our cow into the backdrop tool. We're going to use our pen and our magic wand. I'll come down here and get my red thread so you can see it a little better. And on first look, I might bring my magic wand into this large black area right here. And if I do that and click, can you see where the software did not grab all of the design, the rest of the whole body not? It also broke the line in the um, snout part of the cow. And let me bring you in to this area to give you a thought as to why that happens. We talked before about the thickness of the line and the um, wand bringing us in a double row of that. As you look at this area, do you see the width of the line and then it narrows right in here and then it comes back to the thickness. Because this is not a solid thickness all the way through, the software reads that as the ending of this portion. So it doesn't pick up this area. Sometimes, too, do you see all the shading of gray in here where we have dark and then we have some light? So sometimes that plays a part in the software um, reading a certain area as ending right here and then maybe beginning up there if we click up there. You can see this particular color looks like it just floats out there. So this is one of the thoughts about a raster with all of these pixels is that the image might not be consistent so the line may stop at a certain point. Now, this is not a, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just pointing out to you how sometimes the software might work for you on your raster image. Let's do an undo. If I weren't happy with the way that that picked it up, I would get my pen again, and all I have to do is click on the pen since it was the last tool used. My red thread already chosen, and maybe I'll choose a different area to click. Maybe I'll try down here on that line. And you see in this case, it picked up the lower portion of the cow. It did do some stops and starts right here in the glass of milk, and it's probably because that consistent thick line is not there. I'm only doing an undo so I can take away the red that's already there and you can see what we're doing. Um, maybe we want to try and click right here on the line. You can see that wasn't a good idea. It just picked up a little bit. Maybe we try over here on the snout in the thick area. That gave us a little bit here. What I'm showing you is the idea that don't be afraid that sometimes you might need to click certain areas of the design to get the full design as you think it should be. There might come an area here later where you need to go in and fix this area. This evening, we are not spending a great amount of time on the digitizing part of um, using these techniques. What I really wanted to do is to bring out these tools that you have to bring artwork to Stitch. So later on down the road in other webinars, we'll certainly address uh, very detailed digitizing and so forth, but this evening I wasn't spending the time to do that. But just to show you that you have options don't get flustered if what you're doing the first time is not giving you the um, result that you were after. Feel free to keep playing. In fact, at this point, let me try my complex fill with my magic wand. And maybe if I uh, click within the areas and create my cow that way, I might like it better than doing just my pen. So there really is no right or wrong. It's just the look that you are after. I'll get this area here at the bottom. If I turn on my 3D, you can see that it's um, it's not it's not bad. We could clean that up a little bit. I probably would remove this area in here, and we can see some of the underlay that's coming across, and so for some jump stitches. But again, this exercise was to show you you don't have to stop 
after your first or second click. You can continue to play to see if you get better results. You also have one more tool. We have played with the backdrop, we've played with the magic wand, but the third one that you have is the auto digitizing wizard. And with this one, you'll see it here on the toolbar, and you'll also see it under your tools with auto digitizing. We'll go ahead and click on our tool here. For those of you where this might be your first um, foray into the wizard, take a moment here to show you what we're looking at. Um, this is the design that you would be using. We're not going to use this one. We'll come back to it. But I point out right here the output stitch type. You can choose from it being just regular or auto stitching. Um, and it would be a combination of complex fill, satin, maybe some run depending on the design. Or you can choose cross stitch or you can turn it into artwork. Um, for our purposes, and probably for 95% of the time that you're going to use this, you're going to leave it at auto. However, we're going to go get that same design we just played with, the cow. So we can make a comparison of using this design with our wizard. Something to notice, when we came in here for the wizard, the wizard can use both raster and vector images. The image does not need to have each color outlined and there can be shading to the design. Um, the wizard will ignore very closely related colors though. But in this case, raster and vector. So that's why we see the JPEGs and the WMFs because the wizard can use either one. We've gotten the cow, let's choose it. And once again, we see the path, hard drive, dime folder, images folder, bitmaps folder, and there's our cow. We'll click on Next. In this screen, you do have the option to change the size of your design. You want to keep in mind, though, that if you're using a raster like this JPEG, you don't want to go um, a lot larger in size. You also have the opportunity to rotate or mirror image your design. We'll go ahead and do a Next. It is in this screen that the wizard picks up the colors and you'll notice white, black, and gray. Only black and gray are checkmarked, meaning those are the only two that are going to be applied, those stitching. Even though it reads the white, it does not by default check the white because not only is are we talking about the white here in the cow, but it would also pick up all of this white on the sides of this cow. JPEGs, when they're created, generally have a square outline to the image, and in this case, the wizard picks up that square. So, no, we do not want the white checked. Under the image editing, if you needed to do anything to this cow, you could use the edit button. It would take you into Microsoft Paint, where you could do some fixing up or erasing as you saw fit. We're going to leave it as is, so we'll go ahead and do a finish. It'll take just a moment to render the stitching. We turn on the 3D, and you can see that we have uh, a much better cow than we did with our um, backdrop tool. This was our backdrop cow, uh, a number of cleanups that we'd have to do there. And then this was our automatic wizard cow. The only thing that I might change is if I come over here and select the milk, get my select tool here, and select the milk, instead of it being some satin that are going in different angles, I probably would convert that to a complex fill. I like the look of that better, but the, and maybe a little clean up with his eyes and so forth. But in general, the cow came out better using the wizard than it did when we used the backdrop tool. So once again, don't be afraid to play with the different options that you have. We're going to try it again. Clean screen. We'll go into our wizard. Let's go get the butterfly that we've already played with so you can make a comparison. It was butterfly number one. The file name shows here. We'll go ahead and do a next. I'm going to uh, change the width, so we're comparing like things to a 4, do a next, 
the colors that are red I'm going to leave as is. Once again, I don't want all this white stitching in here, so I'll leave the check mark out of that box. No editing necessary. I'll do a finish. And as the design is rendered, it comes up and looks very nice. Turn on our 3D. There's only one situation that I probably would change, and that would be right here in this area. The wizard turned that into a satin stitch because of the width of this area. So I would click it, right click, convert to complex fill, and there the design looks very nice. The other thing that the wizard did for us, if I click on that black and move it out of the way, do you see that it also did the remove overlaps automatically? So it takes care of that situation as well. We have, um, if we try this again, I have another design started so I can show you some thoughts when you are working with the wizard. This is a design using the zebra. This zebra is part of those free vector files that you'll see under your bitmaps folder. This is what the artwork looks like to start with. This is the zebra when I took it through the auto digitizing wizard. You can see that it missed some of the legs. The black outline here on the legs did not come in and so therefore this front leg is not defined. If I brought it remember it's a vector so I could also use it with file import artwork it did a better job on the legs it did read that black line but remember the vector um, the detail the shading the multicolors and so forth are not as detailed you can see the shading right here on the foreleg is not quite the look of this design and so forth but again um, I do this if I am bringing in some artwork of mine or artwork that I know that I have permission to use, I will try it in some of the different areas um, depending if it's a raster or if it's a vector. I'll give it a go on uh, the, the choices that I have to see if one or the other will bring it in as I like it. You always can edit the design afterwards. I could go in and draw some of that leg if I needed to with my real artwork tools as we did last month, but again this is to show you that yes you have options. We'll do one other, come into a clean screen, we'll go into our, um, let's go into the wizard, we'll browse and we'll go all the way to the end of the list and there you see the zebra but I am interested in the witch. We'll go ahead and open that into the wizard. And really, if you have a good quality design up front, we don't have to worry about too much. Now, this is a little small. I'm going to bump this up to, um, let's try it to 2.5. We'll do a next. I'll leave the colors as offered. I don't want the white, so I'll finish. And the wizard, or the witch, comes up on the screen. And she's quite fun. But this is also to show you that once you have the design up there, it is yours to play with as you would like. If you want to select the gold background and come over to standard and do our drop down, maybe we want the uh, contour look and we apply that. Now notice it did not pick up the gold in there, so what I want to do is change all of that satin stitch. I'm holding down my control key to select it. Right click, convert to complex fill, and then I would come over here and choose my contour and apply, and it's going to take care of that contour. I could also have fun with the witch. If I expand that, let me make sure she's all one piece as a complex fill. I might come in here, I could change the type of fill that she is and have fun with that. I could also go in and change her to a contour or a wave stitch. Something else to um, remember with the witch selected, I could also do a right click and create a border that is in the run stitch and if I want to change that color I can do that instead of standard maybe I want a bean stitch and apply so once you have the design created that bean is a little thick in her broom and so forth so maybe just a two ply there 
that looks a little better in that area, but you have the option once you bring this artwork onto your screen via the wizard, the backdrop tool, or the magic wand, it is still now yours to play with and to get the look that you are after in your design. All right, we'll stop here. Dory, do we have any questions? Dory? All right, at this Sorry. point, I'm going to take you back to the, um, that's Sorry. okay. Do okay. you have any questions, hon? Yeah, we just had two. I like two. Two okay, is okay. easy. Well, could we, could two you edit? <laughs> could you edit the shaded wizard? Um, could you edit the shaded wizard? Let copy and paste in the final file. Import artwork design. I'm reading a question from Linda. Okie doke. Read that for me again, please. Are you talking about that if we brought in a design in the backdrop tool? And I brought in, let's, we'll just bring in our cow back in. Are you asking, can I edit this artwork here? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, no, because this design is already done. And if you want to think of it as behind the glass, we can't do it here. Um, if we use the wizard, remember, and I'll just use that witch, if we go through here at this point, in the wizard right here, you could go into edit, into paint, and edit it with a either a pen or an eraser, um, that type of idea. Yes. However, if we are talking about a vector image, if I, let's just go get an import artwork, and uh, I'll just play with my bulb again because I know If we turn on our shape tool, yes, you can. So yes to the import artwork, yes to the wizard, but no to your backdrop tool. Okay, thank you. And last mm -hmm. but not least, if you'll pop over to the back to the teapots. Okay, this one okay, or, yes. or yes. the bad no. example. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll the go first, into your, there you go. Yes. The red one over on the right, not the pink. Yes. That's a pink. That's pink, a red. The orange over orange. here. Yes. Okay. Yes. The orange one. Can that be used as a red work design? Absolutely. And that's exactly what you're doing here. It's one of the benefits of the backdrop using your run. Is It's very easy to turn a piece of artwork into red work. Because basically what red work, what blue work is, is simply an outline um, of the details. So this is a, a, a great way to use or to create your own red work from the designs that you have. And you can Some adjust them, the dish link, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. Once this is on your screen, the properties that you normally have on a run, here we have stitch length, so you could change that um, to whatever it is that you want it. If you want it smaller, if you want it larger, um, your type, Red work generally is a single stitch around. Um, I have known some people to do a two ply. Technically, it's not red work if it's a bean, but I love the bean stitch because I like that thick look to it. So um, I'm not afraid to break the rules a little bit. Um, just as there's no thread police, there's no red work police either. So <laughs> I can get a good solid look to that with a bean stitch. Okay. So yes, yeah, so all of these questions that I'm hearing um, are great because you're asking, once you have this up on your screen, are you free to play with it? And yes, you are. All the tools, I could even add something to this if I wanted. I could go in and um, if we wanted to personalize this, we could go get text and I could click right there in the middle, change, um, make it a monogram if I wanted to, but let me, just pick here real fast, and if I typed in someone's initials and applied, we could 
put a monogram in the middle of that circle if we wanted to. So once you have those designs created, they are yours. It's just that the tools that we played with tonight, um, that they, they just are a continuation of what we learned last month with our artwork tools, they are just tools that you have to help you bring artwork to your screen and turn it into stitches. Thank you again, Catherine, for a wonderful webinar. Thank you, Dory. Uh, just a few things. Remember, the quality of the artwork going in determines the time it takes to turn into usable embroidery. You now know that Perfect Embroidery Pro software comes with many, many artwork selection of both raster and vector. You know that you, sh you should use artwork sites that offer public domain copyright free in images. Hopefully now we all have a greater appreciation for artwork. So please go create something fun in your Perfect Embroidery Pro. Good night. Good night.